Okay, everyone, thank you for your patience and we will be starting the webinar now. My name is Sonia. I'm a legal intern here at IP Genesis and I will be taking you through the topics today that we will be discussing. So let's get started. Okay, so welcome to another installation in IP Genesis series of webinars on trademarks. We are hoping to be able to cast some light on the lesser known speed bumps that you can encounter on the road to trademark registration. Just a quick note before we start, please leave any questions you have in the chat box and we will respond to them during the Q&A portion of this webinar before moving on to any live questions you may have. All right, so before we get into it, I'd like to highlight an important point. A trademark registration is the right to sue. It empowers you to take action to protect your intellectual property. And I'd like you to bear this in mind throughout our webinar today, because come rain or shine, this point here is why we encourage you to get your trademark registered. So a common misconception, getting a trademark registered is easy. I know we'd all like to think that these processes are straightforward, enough to be handled without seeking someone with technical expertise, but there is a reason why the professional services industry exists. The reason being, that it's just not that simple. Registering a trademark is no walk in the park. It's the same rationale behind hiring a lawyer to represent you in court instead of representing yourself. It increases the chances of you getting the outcome that you want. So the two bumps that we'll be talking about today along the otherwise smooth road to TM registration, TM being trademark, refusal and opposition. These are not common, but they're not unusual either. Okay, so we're going to run a little interactive pop quiz now. I'm going to show you some options to a question and I'd like you to let me know in the chat which of these you think is the right answer. Is everyone ready? Alright, let's go. What to do when a trademark is opposed or refused? Do you A. Cry B. Call Batman or C. Try to handle it yourself? So I'm going to give you guys some time now to send in any responses you may have through the chat box. Feel free to get involved, guys. Or even if you have any answers that may not be on the screen, feel free to put them in as well. Myself, that's what Peter's answer is. Contact your lawyer from Farida Hanim. Augustin Raja says, seek professional help. All right, so the answer is, it was a trick question you should contact an IP agent. You could try doing option C yourself, handling it yourself, but as we mentioned earlier, the chances of you getting the outcome you'd like is maybe not as high as getting someone with expertise to do it. Just a little side note, can you imagine Batman as a trademark agent? That would be a pretty intimidating trademark agent. So now let's look at a quick recap of the trademark registration process, which if you had attended our previous webinar on the registration process, you would be familiar with already. As you can see, there are five stages here and we've numbered them so you know which stage it starts from. Pre-filing searches and analysis, moving on to filing application, examination by the registrar, publication for opposition, and finally, registration. It's important to know exactly where in this process we may encounter those pesky bumps we mentioned earlier because that affects how we are able to respond if a refusal or an opposition comes up. First, we're going to be looking at trademark refusal. So now we are back to that chart we saw earlier. And as you can see, looking at it, now one of the stages has been circled as you can see on the screen, the little orange circle there. And I'd like you to draw your attention to that because here is where a refusal can become a concern. This is the point at which your registration application is to be examined by the registrar. This examination stage that we are speaking of, it's a process that involves some steps including formality validation and substantive examination. And we'll get into both in a bit more detail, but for now, I'd like to talk about the differences between the two. So under formality validation, the registrar is only looking at anything related to formality, as the name suggests. So what this refers to are things like, have you supplied all the information they need? Have you provided all the documents that they asked for? They are not going to look at the trademark itself at this stage. That comes later during the substantive examination. It is at the substantive examination stage that the registrar is looking at whether or not you can register the trademark itself and the nature of the trademark. Okay, so now let's get into the two processes in more detail. 
I have some examples here of formality requirements not being met. So here we are basically looking at formality validation. An example would be the list of goods and services being too wide. So I'd like to highlight something here. Even with the pre-approved list provided by my EPO, there is no standard wording for the items of goods and services that you can include in your application. Drafting of the list needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So just because you use items from the pre-approved list, it's not a guarantee that those will be accepted by the registrar. So moving on to the next example, non-providence of the SSM cert. If you are a sole proprietor or if you are a partnership, you have to provide your SSM cert to the registrar at MyEPO. And without it, then you would not be fulfilling a formality requirement. So let's say you have not met one of these two formality requirements. What happens now? The registrar will point out in his or her letter the formality requirement that has not been met and you will be asked to amend your application according to what's in the letter. You will have two months from the date of the letter to respond and if there's no response within that time, the matter will be considered abandoned and no further amendments will be allowed. So is everyone with me? All good? Okay, moving on. Now, we come to substantive examination. This is done for the purpose of checking the registrability of the trademark under the requirements of the Trademarks Act, specifically where absolute and relative grounds of refusal are concerned. So again, if you attended our talk on the trademark registration, you would know that the Trademarks Act 2019 is our bible for anything trademarks related. So reference must always be made to that. So let's get into absolute grounds now. We are looking at Section 23 of the Trademarks Act here. So absolute grounds of refusal tend to cover visual and phonetic requirements. Now let's look at how an absolute ground of refusal would work in practice. I'm going to use Section 23 sub 1 sub c as an example, which I've put on the screen as you can see in the quotation marks, but don't worry, it's just there for reference. I think trying to read that would make your eyes glaze over as it's quite lengthy. So we'll break it down with an example. So by right, an apple seller shouldn't be able to include an apple or the word apple in his or her trademark because that designates the character of the goods sold unless it also includes something that makes the whole trademark unique or distinctive. But without that, the logo or the mark would describe the apple seller's business and that will fall under an absolute ground of refusal. Now, if we contrast this example with an electronics company named Apple, then we know that that company had no trouble registering trademarks of the brand name Apple and their Apple logo. And if you're wondering who this distinguished gentleman on the screen is, it's Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple Incorporated, the people who make your iPhones, iPads, and so on. So the Apple wordmark and variations of the Apple logo have been registered with MyEPO. And if you're wondering what I have up on the screen here, it's the trademark details for the Apple wordmark, specifically the one registered under Class 9 of the NIS classification. So if you take a closer look at the trademark details up on the screen here, you'll be able to note that the list of goods and services the Apple mark is registered under has nothing to do with the actual fruit. As we can see, we see computers, we see computer terminals, we see keyboards, printers, and so on. There's no sign of the actual apple fruit or fresh fruit of any kind. And this is why registration was possible for Apple Incorporated, which is probably why Steve Jobs looks so happy here. Moving on to relative grounds of refusal, which falls under Section 24 of the Trademarks Act 2019. The sub-provisions under Section 24 itself cover separate and distinct situations, but they all have to do with a trademark being too similar or identical to, another, to like one another, such that the general public may have trouble telling the two apart. To show you how Section 24 would work in practice, I'm going to tell you a little story, which is really the Australian case of In-N-Out Burgers Incorporated against Hashtag Burgers. In-N-Out is a very well-known burger chain in the US. I don't know if the burgers are any good, but if you happen to know, then by all means, let us know. So the applicant here, being In-N-Out, 
has a total of six marks registered in Australia, but the suit focused on the registration details of the trademarks that say In and Out Burger. In and Out claimed that the down and out marks, as shown on the screen here, are deceptively similar to the In and Out marks. And I'd like to emphasize how confusingly similar the two sets of marks are to one another. The colors are the same, the font of the words are similar, even the way the words sound. And the down and out marks even has an arrow, like the in and out marks. In and out also contended that the down and out marks were adopted for the very reason of being deceptively similar to the in and out marks. And they had good reason to argue this. The brand has been around since 1948 and is widely marketed even in countries they don't have branches in. I've never had an In-N-Out burger, but I know exactly what it means when someone talks about In-N-Out burgers because I've seen the brand on social media countless times. In fact, I'd argue that it's pretty difficult for anyone who follows Western pop culture to not know what it means when someone mentions this brand. And I don't know if you can tell, but from the picture on the right here, that's Brie Larson, also known as Captain Marvel, holding a Golden Globe Award in one hand and an In-N-Out burger in the other. In fact, In-N-Out had done a number of pop-up events in Australia itself at the time Down and Out was incorporated. So it's evident that there was a danger of the public being confused because of the similarity between the two marks. It's no surprise then that the federal court ultimately decided that Down and Out infringed in and out trademarks. Is everyone good? Everyone can follow me? All right, great. And with that, we will move on from trademark refusal to trademark opposition. So acceptance by the government of your registration application is not the end yet. So don't celebrate just yet. A trademark opposition can feel like this scary thing that pops out of nowhere. Much like Jack Nicholson in this classic scene from The Shining. Here's Johnny! A little fun fact, that line wasn't in the original script and was actually improvised, which I think is a pretty cool nugget of information. The good news is that your trusted trademark agents are here to save the day. We will carry you through this process, much like Superman is carrying Louis Lane in this picture. And now back to the chart that we saw earlier, we are going to look at a different stage in the registration process. Once a trademark has been accepted by the registrar, it will be published in the Malaysia Intellectual Property Official Journal so that members of the public have the opportunity to oppose it. And as you can see from the chart, this is stage number four. So if someone was to actually oppose the registration of a trademark, trademark opposition proceedings would commence. We've put it down for you on the screen and color-coded it so you know which stages are by the opponent and which stages are by the applicant. So if you just take a little time to look at it, you'll notice that the stages in pale pink are actions taken by the opponent and the stages in blue are actions taken by the applicant of the opposed trademark. The following stage must be done within two months of the previous stage. And I'll give you an example. So, notice of opposition from the opponent. You have two months from that date as the applicant to submit your counter statement. After every step that you see on the left, the color-coded ones, the person sending whatever document it is has to file an affidavit of service with the registrar within 14 days of sending the copy to the other side. So when can a member of the public oppose a trademark application? And the answer is within two months post-publication in the Intellectual Property Journal, which means you publish it, the date of publication, two months from then, you have the opportunity as the member of a public to oppose the trademark registration. And if you've ever wondered what the journal looks like, we've included a picture of it, as you can see the cover of the journal on the screen, as well as a picture of what it looks like on the inside when a trademark is published for opposition. Opposition grounds under the Trademarks Act 2019. So these are generally the grounds that we would use to mount a trademark opposition. Prior use and any of the three grounds under Section 34, Sub 2. Let's get into prior use for a minute. So according to Section 34, Sub 1 of the Trademarks Act 2019, an opposition may be made if there has been continuous use of a trademark before the use of the applicant's trademark or from a date before the date of filing of the application by the applicant. And here you can see where prior use comes in because it needs to be before the use of the applicant's trademark, before the date of filing. So that is what we mean by prior use. And now we get into the three grounds mentioned earlier under section 34 sub 2. So 
These grounds are if a trademark falls under absolute grounds or relative grounds of refusal, which we looked at earlier on, where the applicant is not the proprietor of the trademark, meaning the applicant doesn't actually own the trademark, or where the opposed trademark conflicts with a well-known trademark under Section 34, Sub 2, Sub C. And this is where the opposed trademark is identical or similar to a well-known trademark in Malaysia, and it is to be registered for goods or services which are not identical or not similar to the well-known trademark in Malaysia. So some further requirements under opposition. If registered, the opposed trademark would, for one, indicate a connection between those goods or services and the proprietor of the earlier well-known trademark. There are lots of instances where people would go for a familiar and well-established brand. So imagine you as the owner of such a brand and imagine people started buying someone else's products instead of your own because they think it's affiliated with yours. An example would be if we as IP Genesis tried to register a trademark for IP Genesis using the logo on the right that you see here of well-known band Genesis from the 80s. They're very well-known. So like imagine we tried to do that with the exact font, with the exact spelling. You best believe we'd be hearing from their lawyers. So the second point would be if the opposed trademark would create a likelihood of confusion on the part of the public because of such use by the opposed trademark. And thirdly, the opposed trademark would likely damage the interests of the proprietor of the earlier well-known trademark. So getting into a bit more detail of the notice of opposition that we saw earlier on the chart of the proceedings for opposition, you will officially know that your trademark has been opposed when you receive a notice of opposition. Some things that your average notice of opposition would include would be a representation of the opposed trademark, the application number of the opposed trademark, and the goods or services of which that trademark is registered, and the opposition is based. And you as the opponent, you must send a copy of the notice of opposition to the applicant. A counter statement. So as the applicant of the opposed trademark, the next thing your trademark agent will advise upon receiving a notice of opposition is to submit a counter statement on your behalf. And you can think of this move as the UNO reverse card of this process. The idea here is to flip the situation by explaining to the registrar why you think your trademark should be registered despite the opposition. And just some notes on the burden of proof throughout this opposition proceedings. The burden of proof lies on the person whose trademark is being opposed. And this would be the applicant for the opposed trademark, which if we were to use an analogy, would be Hercules here carrying the burden of proof on his back. The applicant of the opposed trademark has to prove the registrability of the trademark and that there is no likelihood of confusion or deception. And you can see this interesting looking picture here now. So what we are getting into here is that throughout these proceedings, the applicant and the opponent will file evidence and exhibits in support of the opposition or of the counter statement. It's the same concept as presenting evidence in court to get the court to favor your side. We've all seen law and order as for you, We've all seen suits and other legal shows of that kind. Or more recently, we've seen clips from the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial. So it's like that, just way less dramatic. It's only filed with my depot for the registrar to look at. And after all that comes the period of deliberation for the registrar. The registrar then has to decide whether to refuse to register the trademark, to register the trademark absolutely, or to register the trademark subject to such conditions, amendments, modifications, disclaimers, or limitations as he thinks fit. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation on opposition, and I will now pass the floor to Lawrence to say um, a few things regarding our topics today. Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Lawrence. Okay, great. Okay, I think I will continue with uh, from what Sonia has shared with us just now. Thank you very much, Sonia, for the great sharing just now. Actually, uh, these sessions, we are not emphasizing so much about the process of the trademark registration. We just like to hope to uh, shed some light on what may happen, what may possibly happen during the registration of uh, trademarks. So, of course, we do hope that uh, the registration process will be smooth, but sometimes 
sometimes, right, the refusal of a trademark is not uh, uncommon. Uh, don't misunderstand that uh, the registrar is trying to give you any hard, give us any hard time on our trademark registration. Their purpose sometimes on raising a refusal, most of the time they just want to firstly protect the rights and interests of the earlier trademark owners and also the interests of the public. And then secondly, they also hope to examine whether your trademark is truly entitled for protections. So like what Sonia has shared with us now, don't forget the registration of trademark is actually a right to sue. It is actually different from those usual commercial permits that we are applying for. If you manage to register your trademark, right, then the even the registrar themselves, they cannot simply revoke your registration without the good legal grounds, which is why when it comes to trademark registrations, the registrar will be very cautious in examining your trademark application and eventually granting you the exclusive rights. So the point is, as long as we can prove that we can overcome the registrar concerns that your trademark is entitled for protections and then we don't actually conflict with the rights with the earlier trademark owners and also we protect the interests of the public, then there is still a very good chance to get your trademark registered. So can we actually avoid refusals or opposition of your trademark registration? We have to be very honest here. We can't totally avoid. There is no guarantee that all the trademark registration will go through a smooth process. But before we file the applications, right, usually we would advise you to do a trademark search and then analysis because this search process and analysis process, right, will actually let you know the chances of registration of your trademark and then how likely we will encounter a refusal. Because when we do a trademark search, right, it is not as simple as we just punch in a few names and then to see if anyone registered. And that means that we can get ours registered. It doesn't mean that way. Actually, how it works like when we do a comprehensive trademark search, we will actually check for various possible similar marks or names and then we will compare your registration details and the earlier trademarks to evaluate the chances of success of your trademarks. So after the search, we will advise the chances. Sometimes we will tell you, okay, it is quite likely that you will encounter a refusal, but we will also be able to advise how likely you can overcome the refusal. So some of our clients, they are prepared. Uh, they think that they are mark, they are trademark, their brands have a good potential in future. They would like to keep it. So they are ready to embrace the refusal. So we are prepared for the refusal and then we will file the applications. In some situations, they feel like, mm, never mind. I think I'm ready to change name because I have not really started using my brands. I'm, I don't mind changing a new brand. In those situations, they would actually change the, the, the trademark before they even file the application, which is why I say, doing a pre-filing search is very important because it would always determine your next strategy on how to file, whether to file, or whether you want to do any changes before you do the filings. Because not all the changes can be made after you have done the filings. Like for example, if you are adding some new goods and services, right, that very likely you have to refile a new application. Because subsequent amendments on your applications, you can't actually extend beyond the scope of your initial applications. You can only narrow your rights after you have filed the application. So if you are adding some new things after the you have filed the applications right probably you will have to refile a new application so the search is very important before we do the filing so that we can actually formulate a good strategy and then we can anticipate what would happen after that so okay the next is if we encounter any refusal or positions what should we do like just now Sonia has actually correctly pointed out you should look for an IP agent because sometimes right the the issues in the refusal and the opposition might not as simple as it seems. We, we, it might unnecessarily limit your right if you ag agree to some of the directions. So we will have to look at the nature of the refusal. Some of them, we, you will just require us to file a simple res response, like just complying to the registrar direction, file a normal amendments like that. But the thing is, we need to be careful what are the amendments and what are the directions that we are following because some of them might unnecessarily limit your rights. So if you you think that you do not wish to follow that directions from the registrar, you can actually still file an appeal telling them that I don't think it's suitable for us to follow the reasons, things like that. And there are some other refusals which could probably quite com more complex like the relationship.
speculative and absolute ground of refusal shared by uh, Sonia just now. For those kind of grounds of refusal, we will have to file a legal arguments and then very likely that we will also have to file evidence of use of your trademark. When it comes to evidence of use, it's very important. It could be a very determining factor in deciding whether your trademark can be registered or not. So what do we mean by evidence of use? Basically, they are anything that your trademarks would show your trademarks. Can be your invoices, your marketing materials, the, the, the screenshots on your websites, your brochures, even if any third-party recognitions like interviews, magazines, newspaper advertisement, or you have you have won some award, things like that, then all these can be a part of your evidence of use. And then even if you have some foreign registration, like before you filed a trademark in Malaysia, you have registered your trademark in other countries. Those can be used as one of your supporting arguments. Of course, our trademark office doesn't have to follow other uh, countries' trademark registrations. It means that even if you are registered in other countries, doesn't mean that you will naturally get registered in Malaysia. But that those evidence could be one of the uh, supporting arguments which can be persuasive to the registrar to allow your registration because they will consider mm, maybe other countries allowed already, then maybe I can see we should follow or not. But they will also need to look at other circumstances like whether Malaysia somebody have registered or maybe uh, is there any other laws in Malaysia would prohibit your trademark from being registered in Malaysia as well. So getting the evidence of use is very compound, is very important. Like your invoices, you know, those dated one, and especially your marketing uh, materials, those that it's important that we can see your trademark on top of the marketing materials. They also play a crucial role in submitting your evidence of use because the first thing is, uh, one of the first requirements is we need to prove since when you started using your trademark. For example, if you are submitting that you have started your trademark use in 2019, June, so you better have some evidence shows that you really have started use of the trademark on that date. For example, your invoice, your first invoice, or maybe your first Facebook post, or maybe the first launching date of your photo, things like that, or any congratulation notice on the newspaper, something that could prove the date. The, the, the more precise the date, the better. For example, it goes to the like 6th of June 2019, like that. So we we or other competent IP agent would advise you whether the evidence uh, would help or not. So this part is very important. We we can, uh, any question you can come to us later. So, okay. In the event that your one of your refusal is regarding uh, some of those earlier trademarks that have been registered and now the registrar has used the earlier trademark to cite against your trademark registration, we can, there is another way to overcome it is we try to get a consent letter from the earlier owner uh, and then ask them to give you a letter of consent and then allow the registration of your trademark. But of course, this would depend whether they agree or not. I'm just showing you this is one of the possible ways so that it's not just every time you have to argue with the registrar. If they are able to give you the consent to co this with their trademark registration, then it would actually uh, greatly improve the chance of your registration. Okay, so just a second. Okay, so the last point that I'm trying to make is the best strategies for the trademark registration is always coin a new name, create a new name where never this word never existed before. If you have no choice, you would like to use an existing uh, word, then pick a name which has no relevance to your business at all. Try not to get uh, inspired by some ex existing brand and then change here and there because that is very dangerous. Try to be, think independently and then call a new name or maybe pick a name which has no relevance to your product and business. And then also no relevance to your industries. Nobody in your industry is likely to use that name in running your business. So I hope uh, this is what I'm going to share. I hope all this help. So I think next we are going to the Q&A session. I'm opening up to the floor. Please feel free to ask us if you have any questions about registrations of trademarks. Hi, Augustine. Okay, thanks your, for your questions. For us, it really depends on the... You are, you are asking about how much roughly we are charging to register the trademarks, right? Okay, for registration in Malaysia, let's say from Malaysia, including the, the search and analysis and then including filing the application, including the government fees, uh, altogether is about two... We will start from 2003 and onwards, but this is for one by one class. Depends on how many class you would like to cover. Then after that, uh, the, the fees would actually increase according to number of class. Yep, I hope that answers your questions. Any other question? Please, you have, have you encountered any problems in registering or trademark? Or you probably have heard from somebody else that the problem they have encountered, maybe we can help by 
answering those. Sorry, Peter, I missed your message. Is a trademark country sensitive? If so, if I register in another country for a long time, can that be a persuasive argument? Okay, it can be a persuasive argument, uh, but it depends on the grounds of uh, objections. If those that your trademark is actually fall under the absolute grounds of refusal, for example, the nature of the trademark, they are complaining, uh, the registrar thinks that your trademark is not uh, distinctive enough, then uh, those that we the, the registered in other countries, we can always use that to include into the registration and then we can say it's quite it will be a persuasive argument but i have to highlight that whether to accept or not the registrar still have the final call because at the end of the day right every country that had different uh laws or regulations so when it comes to malaysia one the final check by the registrar they still have to look at whether your trademark is actually complying with other aspects of the trademark law as well so to answer your question it is still country by country but other country registration it can still bring in to actually see whether it, uh, we can put it into your argument it can be persuasive okay uh, Peter, I hope I answered your question. Jerin, uh, what happened if the registrar rejects the registration of trademarks under Section 10? You are referring to the Section 10 of the, uh, the new Act, is it? Or the old Act? Because it's quite just a second. I believe you mean the old Act because I think it's quite rare for, for... I don't think the registrar would actually reject the registration under the Section 10 of new Act because the new Act is actually defining the roles of the registrar and deputy registrars. So, but if you are referring to the old Act, the 1976 Malaysian Trema Act, right? That is very likely. That is for the purpose of whether your trema is inventive, uh, invented words or whether they are directly referring to the products and services. So, Jerin, I assume you're referring, yeah, that is under the old act, section 10 of the old act. That is actually quite similar to the absolute ground of refusal Sonia raised just now. So, if under section 10, right, most likely they are objecting to your trademarks that they are not invented words, they are directly referring to the product and services, they are also not distinctive. So, usually when that happens, we will try to find a way to say that it is not descriptive. But most of the time, we will try to ask for the evidence of use, like I, I showed you just now all this the evidence of use to support our arguments for the section 10's refusal but i don't think nowadays the trademark registration will encounter under section 10 anymore i believe by now the registrar should have completed most of the oac uh, initial application unless they have maintained the objection then uh, there will be a second round of appeal already so section 10 is quite similar with the section 23 of the new act which is the absolute ground of refusal so to to answer your question if it is for absolute ground of refusers right we will try to argue that they are not directly Directly referring to the product and services, and then we will try to include some evidence of use as well. I hope I answered your questions. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jerin. Okay, Glenn. What can we do while the registration is still under examination process? I think for the time being, you can only wait, but I don't think it's going to affect your business. You can still go on with uh, running your business using the brand Glenn. Uh, do uh, according to what you asked just now. So when it is still under substantive examinations, right? What we can do is wait, and then you continue with your business but of course if you encounter somebody uh, using your trademark I think you can look at how they infringe and then you get an advice from an IP lawyer first or and then if not if necessary you can actually start by sending them a, a warning notice first okay Glenn I hope I answer your question Okay, Peter, what if one of our customers overseas is also a Malaysian company? And also, is the trademark class sensitive? If so, can there be a more or less similar trademark existing side by side in two different classes? Uh, yes, that one is possible. So long as it is a class sensitive, but the thing is I would like to share is the, the classes on trademark registrations, right? There are 45 classes. The number indicated on the class, right, is actually purely on... Uh, administrative purpose. The key consideration is still back to what have been listed under the trademark registration. What are the products and services listed under the trademark registration? So let's say trademark A and trademark uh, B, which is similar to A, right? If the product and services, they are very different, they are not really related to each other. There is a really good possibility that the trademark, the same name, they can be registered side by side, provided they are the product and services, they are not conflicting with each other. So even if they are in the same class, right? Let's say they are not in contradicting each other, the business, it is still possible for the same name to be registered. For example, I usually like to uh, go into the class 35. Class 35 is very, very wide classes. So it could 
actually register for uh, you are running a grocery retail service and you are running an accountancy firm. So when there is a similar trademark for these two different services, right, even though their name looks similar and they fall under the same class because one is running a grocery, the other one is running an accountant firm. These two trademark, when they are similar, they are still possible for them to register. So uh, that's an example from me, Peter. I hope I answer your question. Okay, I'll move on to Williamson's uh, questions. If a dispute arises between the existing partners who have decided to pass away and claiming both the trademarks, how will the legal system decide who has the right to use the registered trademark? It actually, okay, this is a, a very good question, sir, Williamson. So the questions will down to whether the partners have actually drafted any agreements on deciding this point or not. And then eventually, if you say that it is a registered trademark, right, whether the trademark has been registered or not, and under whose name the trademark has been registered. If uh, they decided to part a ways, right, how would they decide to part? If it's under the scenario, how whether the partners are actually leaving the company or they are dissolving the company, the best is they still look at the whether there is any agreements between the partners or not and whether the agreements cover this aspect. Because uh, the legal system don't really anticipate a way that uh, how they are parted. Of course, they will always look at the common law and also like equity. But the first thing, the best thing is always always looked at the any shareholders agreement or any partnership agreements between them which is why this is very important because honestly speaking we did have similar situation before where they have uh, two owners that actually registered a patent eventually their relationship turns sour but because they didn't sign any partnerships agreement or co-ownership agreements at the very first place right they actually ended up in a deadlock situation so to answer your questions, right, the best approach is at the beginning, sign a co-ownership agreement or any partnership agreement that cover this aspect. Otherwise, it will be very difficult because both parties will have to adduce who have the prior rights or who have the better rights on the IP or the registered trademark. Okay, uh, Williams, I hope I answer your question, but feel free to ask further if you have any more questions. Jerim, what is the difference between uh, R and TN. Okay, R is meant for registered trademark, uh, which means the registration process has already completed. And TM are usually used for those unregistered trademark or actually pending trademark registration. So the important thing is be careful. Do not use the R sign without a trademark registration. You might end up getting fined. It is an offense under the Trademark Act to use the R symbol without a trademark registration. So R means the trademark uh, already been registered. Uh, TM usually means for those who are pending or unregistered registered trademark. Okay, Jorin, I hope I answered your question. Okay, any more questions, everyone? Feel free to ask. Yes, Jorin, that's correct. Just be careful, don't use the, the, the R symbol without your registration. That, that would end up an offense. Uh, Peter, what is the validity of a uh, trademark? Technically, it is forever, but you will have to renew every 10 years. So as long as you keep renew every 10 years, it will be forever ready. Any more questions, everyone? Feel free to ask if you encountered any any trouble in registering of trademarks or you have heard anything else from others is the trademark font and color sensitive okay it uh it is a yes and no situation okay uh when it comes to the font right if you have a it is a yes situation when your you have a special design or uh, on your fonts of your trademarks then during the filings we will actually in, uh, enter the registration with the fonts that you you want so if it's not right usually if we put in the normal font like maybe in the area of times new roman technically you can cover other fonts as well but if you have a designated type of fonts that you you are looking at we you would usually advise you to file a series mark applications which means in one applications we can include two variations of your trademark one is with the normal font the other one is the the fonts that you like and then the color wise usually we do uh, advise you to register the trademark in black and white because that would technically avoid, uh, cover all the colors that you want but some of the trademarks right they have a specific arrangement on their color like for example maybe they started with green and then after that blue and then yellow like that so in those cases we will also ask them to file two trademarks in one application where we can cover a series mark application one is the one with the color then the other one with the black and white but generally if there is no specific colors that they 
they want, right, we would advise them to file in black and white so that it can actually cover their treatment in other colors as well. Okay, so Peter, I hope I answer your question. I'm moving to Williamson's uh, next questions. If a minor design change is incorporated to an existing logo, for example, a change in the color of font, must a new application be filed or can it be amended to <coughs> can make an amendment to be made to the original application. Okay, if it's just a minor change, right, uh, you can actually uh, file an am amendment or maybe if it's just a font type of card, like for example, colors, right, it's not necessary for you to change a new application, but it really depends on how minor it is. Like. But like you say, some of the minors one, really you don't have to do anything. Whether it's really minor or not, I would suggest you to show it to your IP agent first to decide whether that one is minor. But really like just like a change of colors like for example just now i i i use a uh, peter's question let's say we already found in black and white right now you are using your trademark in blue color if you want to change it to red or yellow it's up to you the one you don't have to do anything with your existing application let's say you found your trademark in a uh, standard fonts of times new romans then now you want to change to other fonts maybe one one uppercase and the other one in lowercase the one is fine you don't have to do anything with your initial application as well but it really depends on the, the the extent of the amendments you are making on your logo as well lah. so better you check with your IP agent first before deciding whether you need to file a new application, okay? Well, so I hope I answer your question. Okay, Safira, thanks for your question. If there is an infringement of a foreign trademark, which type of jurisdictions that may apply? Okay, I'm assuming you are saying that let's say you are in uh, someone's infringe your trademarks in overseas or you're saying in Malaysia. The infringement of trademark would actually depends on the uh, where the trademark is registered and then where the infringement is taking place. For example, let's say you register in your trademark in Malaysia, but somebody is copying your trademark, let's say in US, uh, but you do not have a registration in US. In, in that case, right, your trademark registration in Malaysia cannot be used to sue the infringement in US. You will need to register your trademark in US first in order to take the actions in US. So, which is why the registration of trademark is territorial based. It will go according to the country, which is why if there's no such thing as so-called global trademark protections, you will have to go country by country. Our one of our earlier uh, webinars, we actually shared about this, how to go about in uh, trademark registration process overseas and globally. We have two ways of doing it. Either go country by country or we can go through a Madrid system. So Safira, later we can send you the link on our earlier uh, webinars on how to register the trademark in overseas as well. But to answer your question, in order for you to sue somebody in other in one specific country, right, you will have to register the trademark in that country. I hope I answer your question, Safira. Thank you, Safira. Any other questions? We will close in the next three to five minutes. Depending, any other questions? Yes, sure. Hi, Augustine. I'm putting it in the chat here. Peter, the question is, so you cannot start a business in another country unless you register a trademark first? Uh, no, Peter, that is actually, it doesn't work that way. You can always start a business in other countries without your trademark registration. Trademark registration and business registration, they are totally different systems. You, even if you want to start your business, right? You just run the usual business registration process. The purpose of trademark registration is for preventing other and then make, uh, from using your trademark and then to secure the exclusive rights of your trademark. So technically speaking, you can run a business or use your trademark without your trademark registration. But the risk is your trademark might get copied by somebody else. So if you are running a business in other country, the first thing is of course you have to comply with others rules and regulations for opening a company in that country. And then after that, you register your trademark to secure your exclusive rights. So to answer your questions, you can actually still start a business. Then after that, when you started right you can register your trademark at the same time i mean using my own trademark in that country yes you can because uh the trademark registration is not actually a permit to use it's actually a uh, exclusive rights to stop others from using so even without the trademark registration you can still continue using your trademark in that country with the risk that if you don't register your trademark right if somebody want to copy your brand then they might be able to do so the even more difficult situation is they started they registered the trademark before you filed the application so uh, yes you can use the trademark in that country but with a risk lah, if do it without a registration i hope to answer your question uh peter okay question from williamson if a malaysian trademark is copied by someone else in other countries such as china what can we do by in legal terms okay this is a very good question it depends 
what is the status of the copy in China, for example? Let's say they haven't registered in China, right? They haven't filed the application in China. You quickly file the application there. Because if the, the legal system in China is very different from us, whoever filed the trademark first, right? They have a very wide exclusive rights. So let's say the infringer, they have actually filed your trademark in China before you. You will have, you can also oppose to their trademark registration, like what Sonia shared just now about the opposition process. But the burden of proof is much higher. So when you say copied by someone else, let's say they register your trademark first, you can oppose their trademarks or the other way around, if they just copy by using the trademark, right, then you quickly register your trademark in China, then you sue them for infringement. Okay, I hope I answer your questions, uh, Williamson. Okay, Peter, can they sue us if they registered earlier? What if they just registered but have not done any business? Correct. If they have not done any business, right, there is a provisions uh, under the trademark laws that any trademarks that have not been used, then you can actually, I mean, it depends on the country. In Malaysia, right, uh, any trademarks that have, have not been used for more than three years, right, is actually subject to cancellation. So to answer your question, Peter, if they have just registered, but they have not done any business for more than three years, then uh, you can actually apply to court to cancel their registration. But if the trademark is uh, is still a valid, a very strong and very strong trademark, if someone have registered a trademark before, they can still take action against you. Okay, Peter, I hope I answer your questions. Any more interesting questions like what uh, Williamson and Peter's raised? Thank you, Williamson. Thank you, thank you very much. So. Okay, uh, everyone, can you do us a favor? I think we are call, uh, we we are bringing this webinar to an end. So thank you very much. We are still improving ourselves. We hope that we can bring more meaningful contents to all of you. So please let us know how can we improve. We will definitely try to do better next time. Any other contents that you would like us to, to bring up in future, feel free to let us know as well. Please scan this QR code on the screen so that we can get your feedback on how to improve ourselves. Okay, so okay. Thank you, Augustine. You are welcome. It's our pleasure to have every one of you here. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm closing the screen soon. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mailing. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.